Hello, beautiful ladies and gents, and welcome to Classically Abbey. Today, we have a special guest, my father, and we're going to be talking about our shared love of music. So, my dad is a composer and a pianist, and he was actually the one who got me into singing opera. When I was 16, he bought me a, an opera lesson for my birthday. Was it my birthday? No, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. present. Yeah. Hanukkah yeah. present. And that really got everything started. So today we're going to be answering some of your questions and talking about music. So we're starting on Instagram and this is the first question we've gotten. Do you two perform or play together? If so, what's your fave piece to do together? Well, we do perform and play together. What's your fave piece to do together? What's your favorite uh, thing? Oh, there's so many. I like, um, I know you like, Vidmung. I was about to say, yeah, Vidmung. Vidmung is definitely my dad's favorite and I love singing it. So that is a Schumann piece yeah. and it is stunning to listen there's to. There's also wonderful piano transcription by Liszt, which mm -hmm. is extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah. It's because he's got 12 notes for 10 figures. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but it's, but it is a, it's an exquisite piece and there are moments where, um, where the harmony, like for example, when I think uh, the word Schmerz. Mm -hmm. and, and the harmony shifts and Schmerz talking, means pain and it's just it's it's exquisite I mean there's no other word for it it's, yeah. it's a remarkable piece of well music. I mean the history behind it is so beautiful that mm -hmm. Schumann wrote that for his bride and the poetry is absolutely stunning I also like um, is it come come ready, ready and, and see, see me, me by Richard Hundley I love that that was actually the very first video that I put up on my channel of me singing yeah. Um, so you can actually find that on YouTube. My dad wasn't accompanying me, unfortunately, but we do do that together. The only one I don't like doing because it's <laughs> so ridiculously difficult is um, Bati. Is it Bati Bati? Bati Bati. With the left hand, is just it has to be so precise. And uh, yeah, no, it's impossible. I have to avoid <laughs> avoid saying something I shouldn't when I'm playing. <laughs> Well, it's definitely not written for the piano. It nope. was written for the orchestra, and they transcribed it for piano and made it impossible to play. Yeah, it's 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 difficult. <laughs> it's it's not impossible, but it's difficult enough that you can't relax when you're playing it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, so the next question we have is, what musicals are your favorite and mm. why? Mm. And this girl wrote very kindly, "Thank you for rising for thank you for raising such a ray of sunshine." Oh, so that was very sweet. <laughs> um, thank your mother too. I mean, she yeah. Was, oh, was of course. As involved as I was. <laughs> um, two. There are so many great ones. Tell me so many great ones, but 1776. I was about to say, I and, knew you were going to say 1776. And Carousel. And Carousel. Yes. Because yes. um, so the soliloquy from Carousel. Can I tell a quick story? Yeah, go okay. for it. So some years ago, there was a woman who was the wife of a friend of mine, and she was a TV producer. And um, she didn't know anything about musicals whatsoever. And I, she was over at the house. We were discussing something. And I said, listen, let me play you one number from one musical and if this doesn't explain to you how effective and powerful musicals are, nothing will. So I gave her the whole background before Billy Bigelow sings the soliloquy. And I put on the original recording, which of course is the best recording of John Raitt singing it. And at the end, she was just, the tears were streaming of down course, her face. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's as good as it gets. Actually, 1776 is unusual because it's, there's one stretch, I think it's something like 30 or 40 minutes without music. Yeah. It's a remarkable thing for a musical, but it's, it's so intelligent, and the songs are so intelligent. And, and what's remarkable about it is that it kind of reminds me a little bit of Oedipus Rex, in that, which is conceivable, quite conceivably the greatest play ever written. The reason that Oedipus Rex is so great is because it's inevitable. At the very mm -hmm. beginning, um, Ty I believe it's Tiresias, the blind prophet, comes to Oedipus, and Oedipus wants to know why the plague is um, on the Thebes, where he, where he is king. And he doesn't really want to know because, of course, he's going to discover that he slept with his mother and killed his father. So that's yeah, not a good thing. Not great. And Tiresias keeps saying to him, don't you don't want to go there, you don't want to go there. <laughs> and Oedipus is determined because he wants, he's trying to do what's good for the country. And so from the very beginning, you know that the end is going to be tragic, but it's inevitable given what he did. So um, 1776, um, the same kind of principle applies in that you know the ending before you start the musical. Yeah. You know they're going to sign the declaration. So how do they create a story that's so compelling when you know the ending already? Yeah. That's a, that's a massive achievement. It really is. And I will I, I agree with you. I mean, it's totally compelling. Yeah, on the subject of Oedipus Rex and musicals, it's funny. I was thinking about this once. I think you and I discussed this many years ago. Yeah. But that is that 
I was thinking, has there ever been a musical like that? Has there ever been a musical that has that sense of inevitability from the beginning, and that's what gives it its power? And, of course, there is one, and that's The King and I. Because once yeah. the king, at the beginning, before the, it even starts, right. before he says, I'm going to modernize my country, I was about to say, yeah. he's doomed. Absolutely. Because he can't live in a world like that. He's not made to live in a world like that. So that, despite all the incredible music of that, the thread that, that makes it so strong when you're watching is at some level of consciousness, you're aware this guy can't coexist with what he's created. Mm -hmm. And so it gives it a tremendous power. I think. Yeah. No, I, I love I love that musical. And yeah, that's great. I'm trying to think of some of my favorites because, West you know, story, I love all of them. <laughs> I love some, not all of them. I love so many of them. All right, um, let's go down the list. West Side Story. I'm just West Side be, Story. Showboat's great. Showboat's amazing. Oklahoma, all, all the Rogers. All the Rogers and Hammerstein. Oklahoma, Carousel, South Pacific. Right. The King and I. I mean, Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd's amazing. Um, I was um, actually Fiddler, thinking Fiddler's, Fiddler's great. great. And I was thinking one of my favorites, which is a comedy, but I loved it, hmm. was A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Yeah. That's, I thought it was smaller, really, really It's smaller, funny. but really well-crafted. Yeah. It's, and you can say that about certain musicals that they're, they're just well-crafted. You know, it's funny. And I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying this. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I saw Phantom and Les Mis, I felt like they were flip, flip sides of each other in that Les Mis had tremendous heart. But there are parts where I felt, as a composer, it wasn't well crafted. There's a point at which she's singing, I believe it's on my own. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a pedal tone in the orchestra, in the orchestration. Right. And I'm thinking, you know, you've got something with this harp or something playing. And the note dies yeah. in the accompaniment because there's no pedal tone underneath it. And also, there's a rock band, and it's 1820. Like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, uh, to I be mean, fair, that's also true of Phantom of the Opera. Well, but Phantom, it's interesting because I thought Phantom is a, is actually a much more cynical show. It doesn't have the heart, for mm -hmm. me, that Les Mis does in the story. But it's really well-crafted. It is. It's, and the reason I know that is because I, I wanted to hate it. Right. I wanted to hate it. When I went, because it, I played the music a zillion times <laughs> that I haven't seen it, I thought, ugh. Yeah. And I went, and, 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 it, and I kept thinking, this is so damn dumb. Why doesn't she just leave? Yeah, okay? he's, right. he's, he's a bad guy. Why doesn't she? No, she's not leaving. So I'll put the music. I'm thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and then the end comes, and she sings, Pitiful Creature of Darkness, What Kind of Life You Know, and something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as she God, give me him, courage to show you you, you are, are not, not alone. alone. I'm in tears. It's like, what yeah. the I heck? know, I know, you know I know. I was so <laughs> pissed at myself. Like, don't do that. You know you don't like this musical. But the ending's amazing. I mean, it's, it works. He's such a craftsman that he knows he can string you along, string you along, string you along. Right. It's, and you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of An Affair to Remember. Yeah, In that Affair movie. to Remember, great movie. But all through there's this bantering, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's it's kind of funny and it's right. et cetera, et cetera. Then you get to that last scene. Which we're not going to spoil, right. even though it's very old. Oh, my goodness. And and, Tears and, it, and it hits you with a wallop. <laughs> yeah. And one of the reasons for that is that Hugo Friedhofer, who wrote the music for that, wrote an eight-minute cue that is just astonishingly good. Right. And he was also, by the way, the first... He was the person who orchestrated Gone with the Wind mm -hmm. uh, for Max Steiner. And his first score, which I oh believe God, he won Oscar for, was... was, was, was no, but his, but his his first score on his own. Yeah, the one with it was 1939. The first score on his own was 1946, the best years of our lives, which, which is, is also a great score. Right. So when he got to a fair to remember, which is maybe 1957, mm -hmm. something like that, ten or twelve years later, after best years of our lives, he writes this cue, and it just hits you with a freaking wallop. Absolutely, it's just you get the, and the funny story about that is, I was watching that with one of your siblings, and watch it all the way through. And then another one of your siblings, and they're teenagers at this point. Yeah. And another sibling came in just as we had finished. And I'm crying. I'm and and <laughs> I your remember this. crying, right? And the other sibling comes in and... You rewinded and, a little bit. Yeah, and he, he, and he said, well, you know, he said, I'd like to watch it last scene again. Yeah. I'm just, I've just finished the movie. I've just finished it. I'm just, I'm finished crying. Would they run last scene? And I cry again. It's like, <laughs> I just saw the scene. It's, it's that effective. It's, right. It's really powerful. Well, let's move on to the next question. We got a lot to get through. So we have, what's both of your favorite genre and song? That's a tricky mm -hmm. one. I mean, well, obviously, I classical music. Classical music. Because, music because I would say classical and jazz would probably yeah, right. be our two favorites. Right, but classical music and I. We share I've, the I've, same taste in music. Yeah, and I've done both. Sure. I mean, I was a jazz musician from the time I was 11. I was playing nightclubs when I was 14. But, and jazz is amazing. I love playing it. I love playing it. But, the level of intelligence mm -hmm. with classical music is so far beyond everything else 
the level of complexity, whether you're talking rhythmically, whether you're talking harmonically, whether you're talking melodically, um, you look at some of the things they did. I mean, it, one of the things that comes to mind on that is you think of somebody like Brahms, and Brahms had to follow Beethoven. I mean, this is gigantic figure of Beethoven. Yeah. What are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to establish yourself in the face of this massive figure? Yeah, exactly. And Brahms, because his music is just redolent with intelligence, he's um, his music, and he's one of my he and Beethoven are probably my two, and Bach are probably my three favorite and Mozart. Oh, my God! Right. Of all. And but, Handel. But, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, but but <laughs> but Brahms is so intelligent, and and that he's able to go farther and yet it, it, it's the level of intelligence in his music is just amazing. I know Brahms is your composer. favorite so you would say he's oh. probably your favorite composer he will he, he's, he's, the, one, he's the most intimidating piece? he's the most intimidating yeah that's fair Be 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 Beethoven is astonishing because the late the late string quartets are just remarkable the gross fugue sounds like it could have been written today yeah um, but... well what I will say is that I think as, having gone to conservatory which you also did mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that having jazz as a as a prelude to learning classical music mm -hmm. is a wonderful benefit because it gives you a little bit more flexibility if you've only ever studied classical music you're kind of scared to take that step of yeah. of improv improv well, that's exactly right except that when you and you know this as well as I do but, you know, if you talk when in the Baroque period, when they would do operas and did an aria, they would sing the first time straight and the second time they would be adding things. Yeah, they would be ornaments. So, but I have a lot of, that's my point, is that a lot of my classical singer friends are very afraid to throw in yeah, an ornament. Yeah, they need yeah, to go yeah, through yeah, stuff yeah. and they need to make sure that, okay, let's make sure that this all fits. Whereas, I'm not saying that I'm great at it, but I am comfortable, well, comfortable with it. Well, and you know, the, I'm like, okay, I'll just try a few things and see what works. Well, I actually believe that one of the things that has damaged the classical music world is recordings. Yeah. Because, because there began to be an emphasis on perfection. Yeah, it's and, impossible. And that's not good. Right. Because there is no perfect version of anything. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll think, well, that's the greatest version I've ever heard. And then somebody will come along and do something, you'll think, oh, wait a minute, what, yeah, what exactly. is that? And you're always getting it's compared not... against these incredible singers, yep. but then it doesn't leave room for new singers to have their to make their mark. Right. And, 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 and it's subtle. Think, but... And it's subtle. Absolutely. You'll be faithful to the music and make a very subtle nuanced change and that can be so profound i mean there's there's a wonderful moment in um in um the hyphens recording of the tchaikovsky violin concerto mm -hmm. he does something in the second movement where he achieves a pianissimo that is almost unearthly mm -hmm. and that one moment you know i remember when i was studying orchestration my orchestra we were talking about this the other night the um my orchestration teacher said to me when i was buying scores it was costing me 25 bucks in 19 you know 78, which was a lot of money. Back yeah, then. for sure. And I was feeling a little guilty about it. And he said, if you get one good idea from this, you and I were talking about this the other night, one good idea from the score, it's worth buying as a composer. Same thing's true with the performance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll watch a performance and it's good, it's good, it's good. And then there's this moment that's just magical. And you think, I would have paid 25 bucks just for that moment. Yeah. Just for that. And that's why live performance supersedes anything that you'll ever get on recording because you get those moments that are electrifying. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one of the things I will say, and I said this in my blog, is that Maria Callas, the reason she was so electrifying was because it wasn't perfect. Yeah. Was because you didn't know what was gonna happen. Rubenstein, Arthur Rubenstein was famous for making a mistake early in the recording. It's like, okay, now I can play. Right. You know, <laughs> it's, and, which I think is a very healthy attitude. So I'm going to answer this one. I mean, you can answer it too. It's how important do you feel it is for vocalists to have a thorough understanding of music theory? As a singer, I will say we get a lot of jokes about this because people think of singers as separate from musicians. And the singers that don't have training are, are at a disadvantage, a severe disadvantage. And you can't make music in the same way unless you understand what you're doing. You don't understand what's behind you, what's backing you up, mm -hmm. unless you understand why the composer wrote those chords why the composer has it fingered in a certain way, mm -hmm. why certain things are there for you, and why you're singing the notes that he's written for you. And if also, you, don't you have... want to understand the larger structure of things. Right. So, for example, you're, you're, you're in the moment, and that's fine, but you have to be able to see, you, that's the microcosmic version uh, uh, perspective. You want to have the macrocosmic perspective, too. So if you know theory, you understand, well, this section is in this key, but the, over here he's going this key. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is he going there? Mm -hmm. And then you do that, then you can make a larger scale plan for your performance as opposed to every note is in its own world. Yes, I totally agree with that. 
So we've got another question here. What sort, and this is for you. Hmm. What sort of activities and experiences do you recommend doing with kids to encourage their musicality and interest? Well, I think they should all learn an instrument. I, mean, you, I you, agree you, with you, that you, one. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you played violin before you were I singer. I did, yeah. Um, the, um, I think that's important. I think singing together makes a lot. I, I also think Just exposure. exposure. I was about to say, yeah, exposure I mean, to classical music is so relevant to yep, kids nowadays because yep. you're not going to get it from the radio. Well, I'll tell you a story. When I was teaching, I taught for one year in the Beverly Hills school system because they needed a teacher, their music teacher had quit. I loved that. And it was, it was, yeah, you I remember, used you to remember? come in on, on when remember, did I come in? Girl. Certain you days, were, I would just come in and, and oh, join yeah. the class. <laughs> and then, but I taught K through eight. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, and it was just for one year because they, they were bereft. They had uh, lost their music teacher about two weeks before this year started. Yeah. And they happened to know me because I'd done some work for them. Yeah. So I taught there for a year. And one of the things I discovered early on is that none of these kids knew anything about musicals. You remember this? Right, I do remember. So I, so I went to the art teacher next door who became a close friend, and she had a VCR, which I didn't, and I borrowed her VCR, mm -hmm. and for, I think it was a month, mm -hmm. so because they, they had music once a week, I would show different classes, different musicals, partially because I wanted them to expose some music, but there was another reason too, and that was that none of these kids understood romance. So let's do one last question. I'm ready. Does that sound good? Yep. Okay, what is your favorite time period for classical music? Baroque, oh, wow. classical, or romantic? Oh, wow. It's a hard one. Because there's great, the thing is, there's great composers in each of those categories. Yep. Um, romantic, I mean, romantic is sweeping, classical is fascinating, mm -hmm. and Baroque is titillating. Well, you know what? You, you <laughs> Not know, in a sexual way. No, but you know what? It's interesting. <laughs> Intellectually? Yeah. Um, hmm. Intellectually, uh, yeah, I can preach all, uh, appreciate all of them. There's a difference between what you can appreciate intellectually, let's say, is from a composing standpoint, and what you would like to perform. That's you fair. Know? That's a really good distinction. Yeah. Know, I I don't. I I, love, I think classical is my is my favorite as far as all the composers that I love. They come from that era. Yeah. Yeah. But romantic is the stuff I love to perform. Perform, correct. It's like <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm playing Chopin or something. Uh, from the Romantic period, yeah. or Mendelssohn, or um, you know Brahms. Absolutely, um, yeah. Then I I love that. On the other hand, the I love singing Mozart. I mean Mozart's amazing, and he's classical. Yeah, yeah. So I I guess I I'm torn. I'm very torn. On the other hand, the respect I have for Bach is as a composer is because I I studied with one of the greatest scholars of of, of Bach in the world mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was a young man back in, in Boston, mm -hmm. and I mean, he knew it so well that actually, it's a funny story, you know, when you're learning counterpoint, one of the things you learn is you're never supposed to write parallel fifths. Right, ever. yeah, I remember but that. But he knew the chorale so well, he said, I'm going to show you the one chorale where yeah. Bach actually wrote a parallel fifth. Yeah. And I thought, no! He said, yeah, <laughs> really. He did, yeah. And so, um, I remember that. So, um, I, the, the fact that Bach could take these, the, the, the structure of the fugue and write things that are so varied. I know, it's, it's, it really it's is remarkable. amazing. It's, it's just oh, an amazing absolutely. achievement. It's I mean, all of the people working within their structures for their time yep. is amazing. But his were so strict. Yeah. You know, and what he was able to do, because I write fugues, and, and sometimes I'll look at things he did, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, just... It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing really to is. think what Bach did. No, it, I, I agree. And... I guess the the one thing I think I I feel like I have to mention is Verismo mm -hmm. opera because oh, yeah. that's my favorite to perform really oh, yeah. is things like um, Pagliacci, which well, there's is, an intensity to it. So I mean because Verismo is about performing real emotions yeah. and to their extent I guess Puccini doesn't really fall under Verismo but Puccini is not romantic either he's yeah. He's a well, little... Puccini's Puccini. He's... I mean, Puccini's Puccini, right? He, he, he's born, he's, he's born. <laughs> Did you ever hear this story about when Caruso came to sing for him? Mm -hmm. Caruso, and no one knew who Caruso was. Okay. And Puccini, Caruso came to sing for Puccini, and he, you know, Puccini sat down on the piano, mm -hmm. and I think, he, I'm trying to remember which aria it was he sang, I can't remember right now, Recondita, uh, Harmonia, is that what it's called? Um, I think he sang that. Mm -hmm. And um, from, yeah. And he finished, and Puccini turned to him and said,
Who sent you to me, God? <laughs> <laughs> that's how we all. That's how singers all feel about Puccini. Like we look at his yeah. scores and we're just like, oh my God, who wrote this? Oh like, yeah, it's just <laughs> it's, it's an unerring sense for knowing how to reach your heart. Oh, it's just it's, uh, it's that's devastating. That's a gift in itself. That's to be able to do that. It's it's uh, remarkable. All these guys. I mean. You know, when you talk about a composer and say, well, he's not as great as these other composers. <laughs> Hello? I mean, you couldn't... I mean, how do you even match up against those no. people? No. I mean, we're we're so lucky that we live in now mm -hmm. and we get to experience all, all of, them, of these all composers of that have come all through the ages. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we live in an era after Schoenberg, which makes a huge difference. Schoenberg was a composer who created the 12-tone system. He, he, he's, he kind of... It's not clear whether he created it. There were some other guys... But he was the one who became famous for it. I mean, for sure. yeah, theoretically, he's but, the one who created it. And it just opened up so many ideas for composers now. Not to say necessarily that I like 12 tone, well, but it, it does mean that you have the freedom as a composer to compose really anything you want. Well, a couple notes on that. Number one, what, my favorite piece of music by him is actually before he started using Me too. the system. The Five Pieces for Orchestra, yeah. which is an unbelievable piece. I mean, I like some of his cabaret songs, actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are also great. The other thing is that there is a great, great, twelve. one of the greatest film scores ever written is a 12-tone score. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm referring to? I'm not. I was going to I was gonna okay. say, wait, opera? Because no, no, no. I was thinking. No, 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 film score. It's a film score. Oh, yes. I do know which one you're talking about, but I don't remember the name Planet of it. Planet of the Apes by Jerry yes. Goldsmith. It's a 12-tone score, and it's amazing. Right. It's amazing. So well, I was thinking about Berg. Yeah, yeah. Lulu. Lulu. Oh, Lulu. Is just my, one of the, it's fascinating. It yeah. is absolutely fascinating. But Berg also had a whole different take on 12 Tone that is really incredible. But yes, I, I do remember the Planet of the Apes score. No, I don't, I don't like music for th something, novelty for novelty's sake. So if it's useful, that's fine. But the idea of just doing something because it's new. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a wonderful quote in the book, The Source by Michener. Where somebody's talking about something books. that's a great book. And one, and one of the characters is talking about how something was moving forward to something. And the other character turns to him and says, the question is not forward or backward. It's forward to what and backward to what. Mm. So something that's novel um, is not good just because it's novel. Yeah. You know, it's, it's where are you going? I mean, Schoenberg himself said there's a great deal of music yet to be written in C major. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, it's not a matter... You know, Aaron Copeland said once that... The term that was not used anymore toward the end of his life, but was used a lot at the beginning of his life, was to say somebody was musical. Yeah. And that's exactly the point. Yeah. It's, um, I, you know, Copeland wrote a couple pieces I like a lot. He's not a major composer, but he wrote a couple pieces I like a lot. I mean, but we, was, simple, sim simple uh, gifts. Gifts? Yeah, yeah, oh, the Is Appalachian right? Spring. Yeah. Yeah, Appalachian Spring's great. Uh, there are parts of other things that are really good. But that comment itself was a really cogent comment. Mm -hmm. Just to be able to say, above all, is it musical? And does it... A p I, this is something that also gets to me with modern music generally, classical music, is this idea that it doesn't have to appeal to the mo to the everyman. Yep. It should. Everybody should understand classical music. Just because you can compose something that you can only understand if you've had music theory training doesn't necessarily mean that you should compose it. Well, you know, I used to say to people when I was young <laughs> that when people talk about something being avant-garde, um, I, I think, this is my own personal feeling, I might be wrong, but the idea is to be one step out of the audience, not five steps out of the yeah. audience. You, if you're going to lead them, fine, but don't be so far ahead that they're confused and bewildered. It should be something that's they think, oh, that was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. But there's some sort of com commonality you have instead of being so far afield that they just reject it because that's right. the human nature. If you don't understand anything totally, I've always said this, that people have a visceral reaction in all things in life. People have a visceral reaction to things and then they rationalize. Everybody thinks, well, I saw that and I thought about it. No. Your, your initial reaction is so quick, the, the, the brain and the soul are so quick, mm -hmm. that you have a visceral reaction to things, and then you rationalize why you like it or you didn't. So that applies here. If you're one step ahead of them, then they can say, well, there's a part of me that really, maybe it's a part of you that doesn't, but there's a part of you that does like it. If you're five steps ahead of them, they're just going to reject it outright, and you've achieved nothing. And on that note, go ahead and check out my last podcast on the Magic Flute, where I give you guys a little bit of a taste of a few different pieces and excerpts from the opera, and that will let you know how you should enter and see the opera, and it won't be totally unfamiliar to you. Thank you guys so much for listening, and thanks, Dad, for being here. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> go ahead and follow me on my Twitter and Instagram, follow my blog, and subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you guys in my next podcast. Good night.